I do think there is a level of naivete within the Western mindset that wants to take no responsibility, right, for colonialization, and then also show up at the last minute and write this check of democratic elections to just solve everything. From Christianity Today, you're listening to The Bulletin, a podcast about the people, events, and issues that are shaping our world. I'm Nicole Martin, and on our show today, Hannah Anderson joins us to talk about the emerging crisis in Haiti and how nations are responding. We're also talking about a recent lynching apology issued by the city of Salisbury, Maryland, and what we might learn about confession and repentance. Finally, we're joined by New Yorker writer Dhruv Kular to discuss the new weight loss miracle drug, Ozempic. We've got a great show ahead, but before we get there, if you haven't given us your feedback, be sure to hop over to morect.com slash survey to take our listener survey. On to today's show. Today, we are talking about the crisis happening in Haiti, and we are delighted to have Hannah Anderson with us. She's the author of Made for More, All That's Good, and Humble Roots, How Humility Grounds and Nourishes Your Soul. Welcome, Hannah. It's great to be back. As many of you know, we record this show on Thursday, and it seems that news about Haiti is unfolding literally by the minute. So as of this moment, we know that this Caribbean island nation of Haiti is on the brink of catastrophe after weeks of ongoing violence by gangs and political unrest. It is reported that nearly 200 criminal gangs have overrun the capital city of Port-au-Prince, essentially wiping out state security forces and sending thousands of people fleeing the city. Meanwhile, Haitian Prime Minister Ariel Henry, who is stuck in Puerto Rico after Haiti closed its international airports, announced his impending resignation this past Monday. While we've seen similar crises in Haiti, and they've been around for the last century or so, this current state does seem to be more dangerous due to the overwhelming political violence and the desperate cries for foreign support. In fact, it was when the prime minister left to get UN back support from Kenya that the gangs burned down the police station, took over the docks, freed prisoners from multiple jails, and effectively shut down the country by force. When you think about the history of American foreign policy as it relates to Haiti, is there anything different about what's happening now compared to what's happened in the past? It's interesting that this is in the news at this moment. For six months since the Israel-Hamas war has been taking place, you've had a lot of conversations about colonization and decolonization and the effects that that has on a population. And as listeners to this show know, I have argued that that paradigm is misapplied to Israel-Hamas. Here we have the story of a nation where colonization has created these conditions, even two centuries after the end of colonization. Haiti was one of the sources of tremendous wealth for the world. It was a provider of sugarcane, it was a provider of coffee, but it was a colony of the French and all of the labor was slave labor. It was the world's first slave rebellion that was successful. And what happens after they get their freedom is that the French and the Americans, neither one of them wants to see a ripple effect from Haiti to the rest of the world, and particularly to slavery in the United States. And so as the way of sort of making peace, they impose these truly draconian regulations in terms of what it means to do business with Haiti, the imports and the exports. You create kind of a kleptocracy government inside Haiti that is still subjugating the free citizens of Haiti. And then the most reprehensible aspect of it at all, they impose this regime of reparations where the Haitians have to then pay the French for their freedom, a debt that took 130 years to pay off. So if you look at Haiti and you look at this community that's so deeply impoverished and that's in many ways so deeply cut off from the world, that has real problems in terms of its culture. And we can get to that. We can talk about the cultural issues and the way that sets the table for a lot of this kind of violence and all the rest. But there is a justice issue at the core of this story, which is that this nation has been uniquely impoverished because they had the temerity to say, we want to be free. And the world imposed a price on that. To me, when we look at what's happening there now, it's all downstream consequences of this kind of history. And it's a situation now where 
there are no good solutions. It's not like you're going to have a peaceful transfer of power from here. And I think most of the world is kind of gritting their teeth going, we don't know what to do because there are no good solutions right now. Mike, what you said, I think, is spot on that what we're seeing now is the consequence of years of poor engagement, of victimization of a group of people who were fighting for freedom and had to pay for it. Why aren't Americans talking about Haiti? I listened to the news earlier today, and I hear all kinds of things about elections happening in Russia. I hear about Ukraine. I hear about Gaza. I hear about Israel. No one's talking about Haiti. Why aren't we talking about this? I think it's tied directly to what Mike just laid out, that there is kind of a failure of imagination here in the sense that because we're not naming the history and the past, I remember I've heard about Haiti as a place for aid or humanitarian work since I was a child, but I never heard the history of why their country's economy and all the other struggles. I didn't hear that until I was an adult. And so I think one of the things that happens, especially in the American imagination, if we fail to name the kind of colonial generational harm that has happened, when we come to a moment like this, it's very easy to just view it as an individual moment. And over the last, you know, how many decades where we see this quote unquote individual moment happening again and again, it becomes in the kind of Western imagination, the sense of why can't that country get its act together? And so I think there's a level at which people just Without the actual explanation, we have no other explanation and people just kind of get bored with the cycle. At least that's what I've seen in terms of kind of an empathy deficit, if I would name it that. And I think it is directly related to the fact that because we can't name the actual reasons for this continuing crisis, that when we have another cycle... We just can't name it for what it is. And so I think that's even the case within a Christian or a church response, you know, ministry responses too, is it's just this perpetual place that we send aid to, but never really deal with the underlying roots of the kind of injustice that's causing that. And on the point of aid, at least as of now, there has been approval for the U.S. to send about $100 million in aid, but it doesn't seem to be an answer because how do you get aid to a country where the ports are completely controlled by gangs, the hospitals are shutting down? I have a friend who works with the Baptist Haiti Mission, and they've been in Haiti for a long time, and they're actively doing work. The text that he sent yesterday said, this is such a heartbreaking situation. It's evil at its finest. He says, the schools are unbearable. The hospitals are being shut down. By God's grace, there is one hospital in the suburb of Port-au-Prince that is open and treating people, but more hospitals are closed. We're trying to figure out ways to get aid. So when the gut reaction is, let's send money and aid, but aid doesn't get there, It just leaves you wondering, what in the world are we supposed to do? I do think there's a reality to this where some things only come out by prayer. First of all, I do think you send the aid anyway. There's an extent to which you try to figure out who do we have to work with. And one of the things that's important to keep in mind, too, is we we read about gangs that have taken over control of Haiti. Oftentimes in the U.S., we get a certain vision for what that means in our minds. And that's probably a partially accurate and a partially inaccurate thing. Throughout world history... The way society tended to operate was you had governments, but then you also had sort of tribes, families, and then gangs were sort of these extended families or these groups of families that would gather together. Like gangsterism, it's a primitive way of organizing society, particularly when society breaks down. So when we went into Afghanistan to take down the Taliban in 2001, 2002, what we essentially did, you you would hear about these northern tribal leaders Another way to refer to those northern tribal leaders was they were gangsters, and and they were the gangsters that sort of ruled these various regions. That doesn't mean they were good guys. Like, some of them were opium dealers. Some of them were bad people. But when you have a certain kind of purpose, in that case, it was to topple the Taliban. In this case, it's to figure out, hey, there's a lot of innocent people. There's a lot of suffering. How do we do it? American foreign policy often means you end up making, quote-unquote, deals with the devil— 
to figure out, look, okay, if the gangs have taken over Port-au-Prince, what you're going to often have is people going in and saying, listen, we'll work with you if you get this aid to the people. And the gangs will often say, because they want the clout, they want the opportunity to be the distributor, to be the ones that are helping the people, they'll make that deal sometimes. So it's not impossible to get it in. But then you have the other consequences of that, which is that when you make the deal with the gang to distribute in Haiti, there's a sense in which you're legitimizing and empowering them. So it's extremely complicated, but it's not impossible. The prime minister, who's essentially resigned, he's essentially been deposed already. You know, this was not a democratically elected person either. And that's where the culture stuff gets really difficult and interesting because you don't have a westernized Judeo-Christian kind of culture. You don't have a post-enlightenment culture that we would like to see where you say, well, let's just get everybody around the table and figure out what everybody wants and everybody gets a vote. And, you know, then we choose the best thing. That's not the way a society like this works. This is a culture that's built around power and, and loyalties, and which is why these gangs become so powerful and so effective. You have a conservative view that would say, we're going to send aid, but we're going to stay out of it because we need an America first approach and that's not our problem. Then you have a very progressive view that says, well, we need to not step into the colonization mode. We need to leave them to be empowered to solve their own problems. So in both cases, everyone steps away. Not to mention you have a space where there have been no elected officials in the last decade. In a space where there has been no empowerment of the people, no agency to elect your own officials, no ability to have the equity to be able to lead your own country, then you do get a takeover by force. I love the kind of suggestion by Westerners that all that's needed is democratic elections at the same time that within our own country, we are doubting the electoral system. As I'm hearing the reports and I'm hearing the proposed solutions of getting power back to the people, I'm like, yeah, that would be great if we could do that too. And, and there seems to be, again, this both, as I mentioned earlier, a failure of imagination, but maybe it's a failure to live in reality, to recognize that this kind of knee-jerk reaction by democratic we, you know, ish, democratic-ish nations to say, hey, the solution to this is just to get the voice of the people, to get the democratically elected leaders in. And there doesn't seem to be this understanding that you can't even get to a stable electoral process until you have a level of power that can protect that electoral process. And so, you know, not to just throw our hands up and say, this is a mess and we don't want to hear the voices of the people. We surely do. But we're also so far from being able to implement that, that somebody has to have the grit and the understanding that there's going to be several steps before we get to that process, to Mike's point earlier. And I do think there is a level of naivete within the Western mindset that wants to take no responsibility right for colonialization and then also show up at the last minute and write this check of democratic elections to just solve everything it is hilarious to me that the same outlets that are reporting on this and the need for democracy are also writing think pieces that democracy may have failed in the united states and it just feels like that maybe we need to have a more honest conversation about how government works, how it actually functions within communities, and in a place where there has been such collapse of social infrastructure to recognize that that might be an end goal, but it's not going to be an immediate one. As of today, we see that there are right now Haitians traveling the 700 mile almost trek from Port-au-Prince to the Keys or to Florida. And we have DeSantis saying, absolutely not. Let's deploy more troops to guard the coast. And at this stage, I think one of the best things we can do is to recognize those who are from the Haitian diaspora that live right where we are. Well, and because you mentioned DeSantis, his framing of this is fundamentally dishonest. There's something good about, in a crisis like this, deploying lots of people to the border to respond as Haitians come. But Haitians who arrive on American soil right now are not arriving as illegal immigrants. They are arriving as refugees. They have a legal status as refugees to come here because of the conditions that are going on in their country. And I wish DeSantis could come out and say, honestly, I'm going to deploy all of these resources to the border 
because we have this influx of refugees and we want them to be safe. We want them to be documented so that we can make sure that anyone who's coming in and is coming in legally and is not criminal. And then they can go through a healthy legal process to pursue a legal status from here. But the response of we don't allow illegal immigrants in Florida is like, okay, that's great. But what about the Haitians? Because that's not their situation. <laughs> and I just, I wish we could have an honest conversation about this instead of a performative one. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate both of your perspectives. And on that note, we'll be right back. We are back. And today we're talking about a difficult topic about apologies for crimes that were committed in Salisbury, Maryland. After months of debate, the city of Salisbury, Maryland has issued a formal apology for the lynching of three black men between 1898 and 1931. Resolution 3333, which passed unanimously, said the mayor and council of the city desire to publicly acknowledge the lynchings that occurred in this city and to offer a formal apology to the families and descendants of the victims of the lynchings, including the known descendants of Mr. King, Latanya Christopher and Cynthia Polk, and the known descendants of Mr. Williams, Jeannie Jones. Some have said that the resolution was long overdue, but others are concerned that the resolution doesn't go far enough. James Yamakawa, who is a board member of the Truth and Reconciliation Initiative, said this, racial terror lynchings were message crimes. Yet the city of Salisbury has been very careful to word their apology specifically only to the families and descendants of those directly affected. Yamakawa and others are concerned that the apology doesn't acknowledge the resulting trauma to the entire black community, both then and now. And just for a little context, from 1877 to 1950, the Equal Justice Initiative writes more than 4,000 African Americans were lynched across 20 states between 1877 and 1950. These lynchings were public acts of racial terrorism intended to instill fear in entire black communities. Government officials frequently turned a blind eye or condoned the mob violence. The effects of racial terror lynchings, the initiative says, are still felt today. I have to let you know this hits very personally for me. I was born and raised in Maryland, where I now live. I have internalized the stories of my family's history, both on my mom's side and dad's side, their desires to make the Great Migration. They migrated after slavery in the 1900s to Pittsburgh in pursuit of a better life, only to find their imprisonment, so to speak, in steel mills, pursuing a dream that was often fleeing for them, which was a dream of freedom. This conversation does make me wonder, do public apologies matter? I think they do, but I'm afraid that too often they are seen as the end rather than the beginning. And to the point that this doesn't go far enough, I would say yes, if this is the only thing that's happening. It's one thing to take a step, and I love resolutions, because they have no binding effect whatsoever on anything, but we at least get points for saying something. So I think public apologies are important, but we can't expect the apology to do the work that actually needs to be done. And when apologies frame incidents in a way that isn't quite accurate, it almost comes off as disingenuous. For example, in the Washington Post article, it starts off when they were covering the news, they called it the long ago lynchings from 1931. Is 1931 really that long ago, Mike? I mean, my grandmother was born in 1930. Was that that long ago? She's still alive by the grace of God. Yeah, no, I was going to say probably most of our grandparents were alive in 1931. That's not that long ago. I think this is an interesting issue because it's a culture trying to figure out how do we deal with repentance? How do we deal with the reality of our sins as a society? And people often talk about slavery as sort of the original sin of the American project. And of course, these lynchings are a downstream consequence of that. It's part of that same story, part of that same history in many ways. The flip side of this is you have a reaction by some who say, well, why is a current government that had nothing to do with these lynchings offering an apology now. Almost certainly no one who's alive today took part in the lynchings in 1931. So how do we deal with that? I think one of the things that has been helpful to me in thinking through some of these conversations about the long arm of racial justice is to think about the distinction between guilt and responsibility. There's no one alive today who's guilty of that 1931 lynching. But when we think about what those events caused, 
and how they shaped society and how it created benefit for some and how it created, as you mentioned, this widespread trauma, how it created this culture of fear and subjugation. Because lynching is terrorism. Lynching is a message crime. Then what is the responsibility of a society that was shaped by this to correct it? And it strikes me that an apology like this is an effort at that kind of responsibility in a way that can be helpful. But like you say, Hannah, what does it actually achieve? Does it effectively diminish the effects of the terror so that Black Marylanders can look around and go about their business without the fear of lynching sort of hanging over their heads like it once did? In some ways, it's a lot better today than it was in 1931. And yet, defining what we're trying to accomplish by addressing it, defining what we're trying to accomplish through taking responsibility, through repentance, I think is a really critical question that I don't know that these gestures answer very well. Yeah, I think I wrestle with a bit of a callus around any type of public apology because apologies in the past have not led to true reconciliation or reparation for the challenges that were done. And when you think about the specific act of lynching, this is not just a body hanging from a tree. In this particular case of Mr. Williams, body was attached to a car with a rope, dragged through the city of Salisbury with honking and noise, with crowds on the street, and dragged through black neighborhoods as a sign, and then his body hung on a tree. When you think about what that really means, to me, unless the apology touches on the true crime, then what are you apologizing for? I think, Nicole, you are putting your finger on something here that is the difference between an apology and a confession. And there's a lot of ways that an apology can work for me to do something good for me when a confession is only for the other person and to establish the standard of shared acknowledgement about what actually happened. And so, yes, I think some of this does reside in recognizing I can apologize all I want. And sometimes that is self-serving. Sometimes that is a way for me to present as a thoughtful, compassionate person when a confession is a radically different thing. And I think because the confession around acts of lynching or even broader systemic racism does implicate an entire culture, an entire way of being, that is much harder to elicit in a public way. But it goes back to this question of telling the truth. It tells the truth about the past. It tells the truth about the present circumstances. And so maybe we should work more for confessions than apologies. Several years back, Ta-Nehisi Coates wrote an essay for The Atlantic on reparations. And he, as a writer on some of these things, there's a lot that I would take issue with and approach very differently, for sure. But what I loved about that article and what I thought was brilliant about the approach was he said, okay, let's take this out of the abstract. We talk about reparations all the time and we talk in the abstract and talking in the abstract makes it very difficult. Let me talk about one guy who was affected by redlining in Chicago and here are the downstream consequences of that all these years later. So let's not even worry about the abstract of what reparations might mean. What do we do about him who very clearly was affected by this sort of thing? And so to me, that's where you go back to this question of sort of what's guilt, what's responsibility. There aren't necessarily people in power at the moment who made those decisions, who created those conditions for the redlining. And yet there's a social infrastructure and there is a city that was built in a certain way that benefited some people and did not benefit him. So can that society, can that city, can that community say, we need to take responsibility for this in these ways? It's like the more we can get away from the abstract and into the specific, and one of the things that I think that it does is it takes the issue for people who, you know, when it is a pure abstraction and it's just sort of these, these sort of broad categories of we need to repent of racism because of this or because of that, a lot of people who aren't deeply invested in the issues or haven't been personally connected to it look at it and go, but I don't know how that's about me because I don't feel that way. I don't experience that. I haven't affected anybody like that. When you get to the specifics, you can go, well, here are these conditions and how they affected this person. Here's this historical event and how it affected these people in Tulsa, Oklahoma, the night of the Tulsa massacre and the downstream consequences to them, the loss of generational wealth, all of these kinds of things. 
And when we can get into the specifics and go, what does justice look like for them? And how does a community take responsibility for that? It's not saying you're guilty. It's not saying you did this, but it's saying we as a community are responsible and we're going to respond. This apology seems to probably fall short of that, but I think that's what we should be striving for. And to the extent that it's a step in that direction, I do think there's something good about it. If an apology is one step along a journey toward a space of equity and reconciliation, then start wherever we are. But I fear another type of apathy that says, why are you all still worried and talking about this? Why can't, quote unquote, you all move forward? Or as the comments I've heard said to me directly, number one, I'm so glad that you're not one of those black people hung up on slavery which was a direct quote said to me, or another quote that was said to me by someone that I know and love very personally, I wish that we could just move beyond the past and focus on the future because, and I quote, you've already had a president, so we've arrived. For those who are listening, my hands are going, I'm throwing my hands in the air. (laughs) For Christians, it does seem to me that there's a tension between dwelling on the past as a means of moving forward and dwelling on the past as a means of staying stuck because the way I read scripture, God tells us repeatedly, remember the God who brought you out of Egypt, out of slavery, out of the land of bondage. There is a space for remembrance and there's a space for lament. I just want to say I'm always grateful when you share those stories, Nicole, because I don't think most people realize how often their black friends hear that stuff. And people are well-meaning when they say it. And and I know your understanding of that, and you're always very gracious to people. But it is something that is far more common, I think, than most Christians realize, that that those sort of broadly insensitive, often insane things get said. And I just always think uh, Propaganda has a song where he's, you know, there's a line in one of his songs where he says, it must be nice not to have to think about race. To me, that's the essence of, if you want a definition of white privilege, like, which is a word that gets overused, and I avoid it often, but that is white privilege. You don't have to think about race. And our black brothers and sisters walk through their day every single day having to think about it all the time because society is shaped in a way where they're confronted with it. They have to account for it. They have to speak from it and for it, especially when they're in situations where they are in majority white communities and workplaces. The past keeps coming up because we aren't actually talking about the past. We are dealing with our mythologies and our misunderstandings. And even in reading about what's happening in Salisbury, I took a a little bit of a dive into the surrounding context, the immediate kind of environment. And, you know, Harriet Tubman was just a county to the West. Mm -hmm. And I think in the imagination, we think of the past, we have this disparate kind of the North is up here, the South is down here. There's this line that divides them. But we're talking about very dense realities. John Brown's in Maryland too, Harper's Ferry. All of these realities and these very specific historical facts, that's not what we mean we talk about the past. If we're going to put the past to rest, it will mean facing it, naming it, and actually talking about what was the past, not our mythology of it. Uh, About a year ago, when a person who was working on a team with me, we were talking about some racial reconciliation works. We were working with uh, white and black churches together. And she left the room while we were talking about lynching. And I went in the hallway to talk to her. And she said, it was just two years ago that I found out my uncle was lynched in Virginia. And she said, for me, hearing it two years ago felt like it happened. This was not her great, great, great uncle. This was not 400 years ago. This was her uncle. And she described how that pain in her family had kept them from talking about it until just a few years ago. So thank you all for your thoughts on this very real situation. And thanks for leaning into difficult conversation. We'll be right back. Welcome to the 95th Oscars. We made it, you made it. You look great. Everybody looks so great. When I look around this room, I can't help but wonder, is Ozempic right for me? We are back. CNN reports that shares of Novo Nordisk, the manufacturer of Ozempic, are up 30% this year and by nearly 80% over the last 12 months. 
Eli Lilly, a U.S. drug maker active in the same field, has enjoyed similar gains this year. It has politicians on both sides of the aisle suggesting that Medicaid should cover its cost because of the downstream consequences of improving people's health through weight loss. So what is Ozempic? Why are people calling it a weight loss miracle drug? Is it all about vanity? Joining us to discuss it is Dhruv Kular. Dhruv Kular is a contributing writer at The New Yorker, where he writes about medicine, healthcare, and politics. He's also a practicing physician and an assistant professor at Vile Cornell Medicine, where he serves as the director of the Physicians Foundation Center for the Study of Physician Practice and Leadership. Dhruv Kular, welcome to The Bulletin. Thanks so much for having me. Let's start at the beginning here. What is Ozempic and why are people so excited about it right now? So Ozempic is one of a class of drugs called GLP-1 agonists. And you might have heard of Ozempic, but also Wigovi, Manjaro. There's a few of these now on the market. And what they do is they act like a hormone in our body called GLP-1. And GLP-1 has a lot of really interesting properties. It reduces the amount of blood sugar that's circulating through our bloodstream. It causes food to move through the digestive tract more slowly, and it suppresses appetite. And one of the reasons that people are so excited about these class of medications is that they're really the most effective weight loss drugs that we've ever had. And so people who are on these medications, whether it's Ozempic or Manjaro, in many cases, they can lose 15, 20% of their body weight. Not everyone will lose that much weight, but that's kind of the average that has been shown in clinical trials. It's a lot more than I think an aesthetic change. We know that obesity is linked to a lot of health issues. And so it's not just that people are losing weight, but increasingly we're finding that these medications can reduce the risk of heart attacks, reduce the risk of strokes, certainly lowers blood sugar levels, which is important for diabetic patients. And it can also slow the progression of things like chronic kidney disease or fat deposition in the liver. So it's not just that they're helping people lose weight, but there's a lot of other downstream important medical consequences. You wrote the share of the population that's overweight has increased virtually every year since the 1970s. In the years after the National Institutes of Health declared war on obesity in 1998, rates of severe obesity actually doubled, and deaths from obesity-related heart disease tripled. You've also said weight loss is not always a health problem. Can you help us navigate that? How should we think about weight as a contributor to overall health? It's a really interesting kind of phenomenon, and it's grown into a really enormous problem. So if you look back at the 1940s, 1950s, even 1960s, you do not see anything near the rates of people being overweight or obese that you see today. But sometime in the 1970s, certainly in the 1980s, 90s, you see this explosion of obesity, not just in the United States, but around the world. And you know, many people feel like this has to do with changes in our food environment. And so the types of foods that we're eating, certainly processed foods, we also have more sedentary jobs than we probably had in the past. And so there's kind of this confluence of factors that have made it such that we live in an environment that really promotes obesity and makes it very difficult to maintain a healthy body weight for a lot of people. Now, people have recognized this issue in part because obesity can be linked to other medical issues, whether it's heart disease, diabetes, risk of arthritis, certain types of cancer. And so it's more than an aesthetic issue. It is something that is medical. And there have been a number of different attempts to try to address the obesity epidemic. I mean, people have rolled out a number of diet and exercise protocols. There have been proposals to change the way that we subsidize food in this country, calorie labels on food and restaurant menus, and nothing really seems to have made a real dent, unfortunately. So, you know, as I talk about in the article, it is the case that since the 1980s, basically every year, the rates of people who are overweight or obese has increased year on year, and such that 70% of the population in the U.S. at least uh, now falls into one of those two categories. And here we have medications, finally, that seem to have the potential at least to really start to shift that narrative and to change the number of people that struggle with their weight. Nicole, I'd be interested in your, your thoughts on this because in the church, this stuff comes up oftentimes, right? And Christians are often wrestling with, you get an argument at one end that's like, your body's a temple, take care of it, be healthy. But vanity is one of the seven deadly sins and being obsessive about how we look. When you hear this and when you hear how Christians are talking about this, what are you seeing? What are you intuiting? 
Yeah, this is really a complex topic because of what you just named, Mike. I've been in conversations mostly with women who've talked about pros and cons of Ozempic. For some women, it's a thank God that something exists to help me get this under control because, you know, my breathing was off or because I wasn't feeling good. My health issues were bad. So now that I'm on Ozempic, I'm losing all this weight and I look great and I feel better. On the flip side, I have heard women who are already small saying, I wish I could just get on Ozempic and I could lose that last 10 pounds. So there's the glamorized culture. And it doesn't help when you have celebrities admitting that they're on these types of things and giving the reason that they're on it because they don't like to exercise or they're on it because they, you know, they don't want to sweat. The first thing to draw out is that these drugs aren't for everyone, either because maybe medically you don't need the drugs or because there are certain side effects that we haven't talked about. I mean, people do experience nausea, sometimes constipation, diarrhea, mostly GI side effects. The cost can be really burdensome for some people, so these medications aren't necessarily covered by uh, insurance companies. And we want to make sure that people are using these medications in a responsible way, a way that promotes their health and well-being. And so thinking about not only the medical aspects, but the cultural aspects, as you raised, I think is a really important part of this discussion. As a physician, what does obesity do to the body? Part of the debate is the health benefits of weight loss far outweigh the financial cost up front. And as I mentioned at the top of the segment, I mean, there's debate about the extent to which these could even be government subsidized in some ways. So what is the medical benefit? Why would someone looking at this want to say, well, for the sake of my health, this actually does matter? So the first thing to recognize is that we kind of use a very crude marker to define obesity. We use something called BMI, body mass index. And if you're above a a body mass index of 25, it's considered overweight, and above 30, it's considered obese. There are people who are at higher BMIs who are metabolically healthy, meaning their blood pressure is fine, their glucose levels are fine, they're not having a lot of issues with high cholesterol and so on. And similarly, there are people who have low BMIs that do have some of those issues. So it's not a one-to-one relationship here. That being said, generally, as your BMI increases, there are greater risks of a number of medical problems. Some of those fall into cardiac risk factors, orthopedic risk issues, meaning arthritis, difficulty getting around. There are breathing problems that can be exacerbated, and even some cancers that are linked to obesity. And so there are a number of medical problems that go hand in hand with obesity. Some of the new studies that are coming out show that a lot of these things can potentially be averted by some of these medications. And that pathway doesn't necessarily seem like you have to lose a bunch of weight necessarily for those things to be true. It could be the case that GLP-1 agonists like Ozempic and these other medications are acting through other pathways that reduce your risk for some of these medical issues. And so certainly there are ways in which the pathway may be you lose weight and then you're at a healthier body weight and you don't have to struggle with some of these things. But even independent of that, it's possible that it it induces a lot of positive health benefits. I think it's important to point out is that Generally, you have to stay on the medication to maintain the weight loss. And so people who get on the medications, then get off the medications, they tend to gain back the weight. And so for someone to commit themselves to decades of injecting themselves with one of these medications, it's not something to be taken lightly. We live in a society that in many ways is arguably over-medicated. We prescribe drugs for everything. So is there concern about creating another ecosystem here where we're just going to sort of medicate this forever rather than train people, teach people, coach people into better, healthier habits that are more sustainable and don't cost two grand a month to sustain them. You know, it's a good point. I think over-medicalization is something that we should be thinking about, not just with obesity or these medications, but more generally in society. I think one of the things that it's important to point out is that A lot of these other interventions haven't worked very well for a lot of people. It's not like people have not been trying for several decades to put together the right set of incentives or the right kind of care protocols to get people to a healthier body weight. And so those things haven't worked tremendously well. That's not to say that that shouldn't be part of the solution. I don't think that we should be advocating, you know, you just take these pills or you just take these medications and don't worry about what you eat or whether you exercise. No, those things are incredibly important and we should be encouraging people to engage in them. One thing that is important to point out as well is that in the clinical studies, it seems that most people tolerate these medications very well. And so there are a group of maybe 5 or 10% of people who end up coming off the medicine because they have side effects that they're not able to tolerate. 
that seems to be a little bit different in the real world. Now, we're still getting a lot of evidence on this, and, and it's still early in a lot of ways. But some estimates have put that maybe a third or half or even two-thirds of people who start on one of these medications are not taking it one year later. And so we need to unpack that and understand, you know, is it side effects? Is it cost? Is it something else that's leading a lot of people who get on the medications in the real world not to be able to stay on them for the long term? If you had to predict how this is going to look in a few years, like five years from now, will people be buying Ozempic over the counter? Is this going to be sort of a practical mainstream medicine for weight loss, do you think? You know, I think it will be much more widely used than it is right now. Because it's kind of hard to get right now, right? Yeah. Like it's hard to get a prescription. Exactly right. So I don't, I don't think it's going to be over the counter, but but I think <laughs> it will be something that um, a lot more people are on. There are obviously cost issues, side effect issues, and other challenges that we have to get through in order to make sure the people that need these medications can get them. You know, a lot of people have said, you know, this is going to completely change society. Krispy Kreme is going to go out of business. Airlines are going to run more efficiently because people weigh less. All these downstream effects, and I think it's really too early to make those types of claims. We are seeing some really interesting anecdotal evidence. So people who are on these medications have said they don't feel like gambling as much. They don't feel like smoking or drinking. And that suggests that we know that there are receptors for these medications, not just in the gut, but in the muscle and the liver and the brain. And so it may be changing our psychology subtly such that some of these other types of behaviors people don't want to engage in as much. How broad a change that kind of motivates across society, I think it's too early to tell, but it's something that I think we should keep an eye on as well. So long as there's a red glowing sign that says hot donuts now, <laughs> there will be Krispy Kreme. I just want to predict that. All right. Drew Kular, thank you so much for this. We're going to link to your New Yorker essay about Ozempic in the show notes. Thank you so much for, for having me. This was great. Thanks to all of you for listening. We will be back next week. The Bulletin is a production of Christianity Today. It's executive produced by Eric Petrick and Mike Cosper. It's produced by Clarissa Mall and Matt Stevens. Post-production by TJ Hester. Our art for this episode is by Rick Shooks. Music by Dan Phelps. And social media by Kate Lucky. Thanks for listening.